Today, our journey takes us back to the early morning of July 2nd, 1937. The Lockheed Electra 10E, a silver bird with a destiny etched into the clouds, soared over the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. On board, a trailblazing aviator, Amelia Earhart, was in the midst of circumnavigating the globe, a daring feat that captured the world's imagination. As the Electra pressed forward the Earth's vast blue canvas beneath, the radio crackled with the last transmission from Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan. We are on the 157337, flying north and south. And with those words, a chapter in aviation history was written, but it was also a prelude to decades of one of the world's most perplexing mysteries. What happened next? Where did the Lockheed Electra go? Did it vanish into thin air, swallowed by the boundless ocean below, or did it embark on a clandestine journey, hidden from the prying eyes of the world? Join us as we unravel the enigma of Amelia Earhart's final flight, a tale of courage, ambition, and the secrets that linger high above the horizon. Fasten your seatbelts, dear listeners, as we navigate the twists and turns of Amelia Earhart's fateful journey, seeking answers in the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, as the story unfolds and the mystery of the skies beckon us once more. Welcome to Destination Aviation. Well, some of you might have thought I was dead in a ditch somewhere because it has been quite a while since we put a podcast out. But all I can say is I've been extremely busy. If you listen to the podcast, you know that we went down to Aruba, which was a phenomenal trip. It was a great time. If you've never been to Aruba, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. If you fly into Aruba, you're flying into the Queen Beatrix International Airport. I actually had a friend of mine give me a, uh, a chart from the airport. Uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, customs was easy. When you fill out your embarkation form, uh, you put on there if you're there for sun, fun, and beaches. Uh, definitely not getting that in the United States. You get uh, business or pleasure in a dirty stare usually. <laughs> but no, they uh, they definitely love tourists there. And customs was a breeze. It was. I flew down on Spirit. Not a huge fan necessarily of Spirit. Um, I've. You know, we just it invokes. I we told somebody uh, about it, and you get the look of like, oh my god, spirit, right? Well, I would give myself that look, but quite honestly, it really worked out nicely. Uh, we flew out of O'Hare, connected through Fort Lauderdale, had a great connection time. Everything was was running smooth. Um, we even upgraded on the way back to the big seats, which you know kind of makes you feel like you're spirit first class, so white trash first class. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was, uh, it was, it was, I, I can't actually say good enough good things. I mean, you know what you're getting into, right? Our bag was overweight. So you pay the extra fee, but, uh, the guy at the counter, you know, moved my, my bag, we had a little less weight in it. So they moved that around and, uh, were able to come up with a solution that was a little less money. So, uh, kudos to the spirit staff. Sorry for probably in my own mind judging you, but it worked out very nicely. So spirit to, uh, Aruba. And I would say after all the charges and everything, it probably was around 1100 to $1,200 in fees for the flight, but it's really not bad, not bad at all. So I would highly recommend. And like I said, the Island's great. It's kind of an eclectic group, uh, but it's, it's awesome. It's, it's a bunch of people that, uh, you could tell they really appreciate tourists being there. Uh, you know, it feels very safe. We rented a Jeep and drove around uh, and, and got to see some of the smaller aircraft, some ATRs and stuff heading off to Brazil. Uh, so that was cool to watch for aviation enthusiasts like everybody that's on this line. So uh, put Aruba on the bucket list. Uh, I don't believe there's a Kokomo out there. So in the song from the Beach Boys, Aruba, Jamaica, who I want to take you. <laughs> uh, but it starts with Aruba. So go to Aruba, have fun. It's safe. It's enjoyable. Um, and when you get back, people will whisper to you, Natalie Holloway. But uh, besides that one very specific incident that happened in Aruba, uh, it seems like a very nice island. It wasn't that windy. We were there, but we hear that's unusual for uh, Aruba. So but definitely enjoyable. I would throw it on the list if you haven't gone yet. Uh, it's not too bad for us. It's about a seven-hour flight total. So uh, get on Spirit. Enjoy. Get the big seat if you want to. It was only an extra 75 bucks. <laughs> Everybody's probably seen the sad news of the Bombardier Challenger 600 that crashed outside of Naples. Um, we don't know too much about it yet. Uh, you know, there was coming in for an approach that left Ohio State University. I believe the operator was Hoppajet with five uh, individuals on board and coming into Naples and lost both engines, landing on Interstate 75, hitting a vehicle. 
Uh, both pilots passed away, but the passengers and the crew member were able to get off of the aircraft. Um, it's, I don't know, you know, I was talking about this with some friends. It's interesting, um, you know, a dual engine failure like that. It flew roughly, what, 900, 800 miles from Ohio down um, and then uh, lost both engines on approach. There was, not that I saw any reported horrible weather like the other podcasts we had where, um, you know, the 737 landed on the berm in Louisiana after getting water dumped into the engines. I did not see anything about that. Plus this aircraft's not old, but I think it's within the last 10 years. So it's, uh, should have had, you know, a good amount of testing through its engines before. Didn't hear any reports of birds. Uh, and so, you know, and then there was fire when the aircraft crashed. It makes you think potentially of an inadvertently shutting down of engines or something. Um, but we won't jump to conclusion until we see the NTSB report, but it's, uh, sad for the families involved, um, and the Naples airport as well. They've been going through a lot of stuff down at Naples where the community wants the airport to move. So I'm sure for those that want to use this as their sounding box, they will, of how dangerous an airport is. And But the reality is, where do you move an airport um, that, you know, there's not going to be accidents, kind of like the same with the interstate. You're not going to move an interstate because there's accidents. So I, I, don't, I don't know. It will be curious to see how this continues to go. Uh, sad for the families. Um, but you know, like I said, hopefully through the investigation, we'll all learn something that will help us, uh, collectively as aviators. So this is something that was interesting. I haven't seen this in some time, but a passenger aircraft at the Belgrade airport makes an emergency return after it hit the instrument landing system, uh, on an opposing runway. All I see online are pictures of this aircraft after it circled for an hour and landed back down. Um, it's ripped apart fuel leaking out of the left wing, um, I mean, it really destroyed some of that equipment. I, I would c- be curious how it veered off a parallel runway and smashed into instrument landing equipment and did that much damage. Um, I don't know if it was windy or, or what was going on here. The reports don't necessarily say, but uh, it is uh, impressive that nothing major happened to it. Uh, it was an Embraer um, 195 and uh, scheduled to uh, Germany, and yeah, it's Ma- Mar- 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 Marathon, let's go with Marathon Airlines, <laughs> but glad to see nobody got hurt here, and that the aircraft's on the ground, well, nobody got hurt, the aircraft looks like it got extensively hurt uh, in this one, and I'm assuming that landing equipment's not looking much better. Well, this is more of a uh, business crash and burn, but the company set jet. Uh, out of Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, completely folded like Jeff in a lawn chair. <laughs> no, uh, I feel bad for the people that invested in it, but that's the problem with these flight brokers. They don't really have any real assets, and when they burn through all their cash, they're gone overnight. I mean, you hear some airport directors out there just raving and ranting about how great it is to have a company like this on their airfield, and then it's just a complete and utter failure. And then unfortunately, in aviation, as Richard Branson said, uh, if you want to be a millionaire in aviation, start off as a billionaire. So uh, sorry to those people that invested their money into SetJet. Sounds like they are long gone. They're not coming back. And they've also said that they've crashed and burned so hard that they're not going to give out any refunds. So uh, sorry to that group, but hopefully the next endeavors will be a little bit better. It's always interesting to me at these airports when someone comes in with this new fascinating idea, but it really is just a switch or a shift or a niche to the same situation of flying that's always existed. Um, but that's aviation. It's hard. It's tough. Uh, and there's some really good operators out there, but uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of these type of operators where they fold under night and then you never see them again. So uh, sorry to our folks down in Scottsdale. So like I said, I've uh, been out. I've been traveling, most leisure and also business. I was just down in San Antonio, Texas, uh, went to the San Antonio airport. They're under a big uh, revitalization of the terminals, combining them. They got a bunch of stuff going on down there. Uh, and I will say I was flying on United and the San Antonio terminal was very, very cramped. Uh, we're talking long lines for the bathroom, uh, basically nowhere to sit for a uh, concession. So uh, it appears they need some more space, which sounds like they're getting so good for them and the team down in San Antonio. But uh, for the podcast itself, you probably see the news that someone has said that they may have found Amelia Earhart's plane. 
Uh, and so that kind of spurred me into wanting to talk about the whole story collectively. Uh, she's a little bit from the Chicago region. She went to high school here, as everybody probably knows or will know after this podcast, the Purdue connection, which is big not only uh, you know for Indiana, but the regional and, and quite honestly, space travel. And I think there's more astronauts at Purdue University than any other university. So I thought it was a good topic to talk about. So maybe we'll get into a little bit of the history here and then talk about recent events on Amelia Earhart. So thanks for coming along with us on this journey, and we will get into our story now today. So Amelia Earhart was born on July 24th, 1897 in Atchison, Kansas. Amelia and her sister had a spirited adventure. They would set off to explore the neighborhoods almost daily. Uh, as a child, Earhart spent hours playing with her sister Pidge, climbing trees, hunting rats, with a rifle. That sounds like fun. (laughs) I know Uh, people in my family that hunt squirrels, um, not necessarily, I don't, wouldn't want to do it, but to each their own. Uh, And belly slamming her sled down the hill. Although the love of the outdoors and the rough and tumble play was common to many youngsters, some biographers have characterized Earnhardt as a tomboy. The girls kept worms, moths, cattydales, and tree toads in a growing collection gathered in the outings. In 1904, with the help of her uncle, Earnhardt began to cobble together a homemade ramp fashioned after a roller coaster she had seen on a trip to St. Louis, and she secured the ramp to the roof of the family tool shed. Earnhardt was documented first flight and dramatically. She emerged with a broken wooden box and had several of her sleds uh, bruised up her lip, uh, tore her dress, uh, and she exclaimed, Oh, Pidge, it was just like flying. So... That was probably her first moment into the skies. Uh, but yeah, crazy. Like I said, uh, not necessarily some of the stuff I want to do, but I could understand some of it. Uh, maybe flying off a roof, that, that could be fun. So the family's fortunes improved and then shifted a little bit as time went on. Um, when they moved to Des Moines, Iowa, uh, they actually hired two servants. Uh, and it became apparent, though, that Amelia's father, Edwin, was an alcoholic. Uh, Five years later, so this would have been 1914, he was forced to retire from the uh, railroad and forced into rehabilitation. Uh, This would have been the Rock Island Railroad. Um, At this time, around there, Amelia's grandmother, uh, Amelia Otis, died suddenly but left a substantial estate that placed her daughter's share in a trust. Fearing that Edwin's drinking would drain the funds, the Otis house was auctioned along with all the contents, Uh, Amelia was broken and later described it as the end of her childhood. During a Christmas vacation in 1917, Amelia visited her sister in Toronto. World War I had been raging, and Amelia saw returning wounded soldiers. After receiving training as a nurse's aide from the Red Cross, she began work at the Voluntary Aid Detachment at the Military Hospital in Spandinia. Her duties allowed her to encounter with many military aircraft pilots, which spurred her interest into flying. At about that time in the early 20th century, Amelia Earhart, a pioneer in figure aviation, attended a fair during the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto. The experience ignited a deep interest in aviation for Earhart, leading her to explore air circuses in the surrounding areas. One memorable day, a World War I ace showed his flying skills performing daring maneuvers in the sky. Amelia, along with her friend, found themselves in the crosshair of the pilot's attention as he dived towards them. Despite the risk, Amelia stood her ground, later reflecting on the encounter with a sense that the little red airplane had spoken to her in a way she couldn't comprehend at the time. Fast forward to 1919, Amelia initially planned to enter Smith College, following in her sister's footsteps. However, she took a different path, enrolling in medical studies and various programs at Columbia University. A year later, she left her studies to be with her reunited parents in California. The turning point in Amelia's life came on December 28, 1920, when she attended an aerial meet in Long Beach, California with her father. Intrigued by the possibilities of flight, she booked a passenger flight with Frank Hawks for the following day, which cost $10 for a 10-minute ride. Boy, wouldn't that be nice now? I don't even think you could get $10 and get a foot in into an airplane these days. <laughs> the experience was transformative, solidifying her determination to become a pilot. The following month, Amelia enlisted Nettie Schnook as her flying instructor and embarked on her aviation journey. Despite various odd jobs to fund her flying lessons, Amelia managed to save $1,000. Her first lesson took place on January 3, 1921 at Kenner Field in Long Beach. 
and she used a crashed salvage Curtis JN4 Canuck for training. Undeterred by the challenges, Amelia preserved purchasing her first plane, a bright chrome yellow Kenner Airstar biplane nicknamed the Canary. Despite Snook's advice, Earnhardt made the unconventional decision to buy an aircraft, making the beginning of her solo flying adventures. Her determination and passion for flying led her to set the world record for female pilots, reaching altitudes of 14,000 feet on October 22, 1922. Not long after, on May 16, 1923, Amelia received another milestone, becoming the 16th woman in the United States to be issued a pilot's license by the Federation Aerotique International. The license marked the first official recognition of her accomplishments and set the stage for a remarkable aviation career that would follow. So financial times had hit tough again throughout the 1920s, a disastrous investment in a failed gypsum mine, Amelia's inheritance steadily diminished. The funds administered by her mother were eventually exhausted, leaving Amelia with no immediate prospects for recouping her investment in flying. In a strategic move, she sold her beloved plane, the Canary, and a second Kenner using the proceeds to purchase the Yellow Kissel Gold Bug Speedster, a two-seat automobile which she named Yellow Peril. Facing an exacerbation of her old sinus problem and unsuccessful sinus operations, Amelia explored various ventures, including setting up a photography company. However, she eventually decided to take a new direction. And that direction was starting a podcast called Destination Aviation. No, never mind. (laughs) That's ours. Uh, But no, what she ended up doing... So where was I? I'm reading my own stuff here, and now I've messed myself up. Oh, Jeff, how dare you? We were on such a good roll there, too. (laughs) All right, let's see. Uh, Find on my script, where was I? Yes, yes, you're listening to this live. I, um, well, live to you. I'm not going to go back and record this. Why should I? You should know that I'm human. Um, (laughs) uh, Let's see. Um... Ah, yes, yes, yes. We were in 1924, friends. Following her parents' divorce, Amelia embarked on a transcontinental trip from California to Boston with her mother and Yellow Pearl. The journey included stops throughout the western United States and a jaunt to Banff, Alberta. In Boston, er Amelia underwent a more successful sinus operation, making a turning point in her health. Despite her recuperation, financial constraints forced Amelia to abandon her studies at Columbia University and any plans for enrolling in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You know, I know someone who went to MIT and they're kind of a failure in life. So concerning Amelia didn't go there, I think we're okay. Kidding, kidding. Uh, MIT is a great school. But this person went there for English, which is kind of like, ew. Like when someone says, hey, I'm going to go to MIT, you're like, okay, show me a bunch of math. Oh, wait, you went there for English, so you're just going to be a horrible person to everybody. (laughs) No, it's less about MIT as it is probably about that person, but they are ridiculous, and they're ridiculous in the aviation community, so we'll just leave it at that. (laughs) Uh, If you want to know more, feel free to drop me a line at dapodcast85 at gmail.com. Employment became a necessity, leading her first to teaching and later to becoming a social worker at the Denson House, a Boston settlement house. Living in Medford, Massachusetts, Amelia continued her interest in aviation, becoming a member of the American Aeronautical Societies Societies? Studio. It's more like it. American Aeronautical Societies Boston chapter. She flew out of the Denson Airport and played a role in financing its operations. As her local celebrity grew, Amelia laid out plans for an organization devoted to female flyers. In 1928, Charles Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic, Amelia received a phone call from Captain Hilton Rayleigh, asking her, would you like to fly the Atlantic? The offer came as a part of a project coordinated by George Putnam to publish a book as the publicist. Amelia joined William Stoltz as a co-pilot mechanic, Lewis Gordon, and the historic flight across the Atlantic in a Fokker FVIIB-3M. I don't know that aircraft type, but we'll just leave it at that. (laughs) Um, Named Friendship, departing from the Trespassery Harbor in Newfoundland on June 17, 1928. They landed in uh, near Berry Point, South Wales, after 20 hours and 40 minutes. Although Amelia did not pilot the aircraft, her role as a passenger 
was added by the duty of keeping the flight log marked by a significant achievement. Um, I'm sure uh, that's not the role she wanted to play in that flight, but nevertheless, she was there. Uh, the triumphant return to the United States on July 6, 1928, brought Earnhardt, Stoltz, and Gordon a ticker tape parade along the Canyon of Heroes in Manhattan. Their journey was celebrated with a reception by President Calvin Coolidge at the White House, cementing Amelia in a place in aviation history. Training on her physical resemblance to famed aviator Lucky Lindy, some media outlets began dubbing her as Lady Lindy, while the United Press went even further, crowning her the Queen of the Air. Amelia's return to the U.S. in 1928 kick-started an exhaustive lecture tour, a venture that she undertook alongside a marketing campaign orchestrated by George Putnam. The comprehensive strategy included publishing a book authored by Earnhardt, new lecture tours, and a mass market endorsement for products such as luggage, Lucky Strike cigarettes, and women's clothing. My grandfather actually smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes. He would uh, strike matches off the bottom of boots. He worked for Bell South Telephone Company. Um, but uh, I digress there. Just interesting, the, the Lucky Strike stuff. Uh, interesting, the money Earnhardt and earned while endorsing Lucky Strikes was earmarked for a noble cause, a $1,500 donation to Commander Richard Byrd's South Pole Expedition. The marketing campaign fueled by Amelia and Putnam successfully established Amelia Earhart's mystique in the public's imagination. Beyond being a mere endorser, Amelia actively participated in the promotions, especially in the realm of women's fashion. Known for her simple natural lines and wrinkle-proof washable materials, she became a symbol of purposely femininity. The luggage line she promoted, Mondarian Earhart Luggage, also carried her unmistakable stamp. Amelia's celebrity endorsements played a crucial role in financing her flying endeavors. As an associate editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine, now that I didn't know, that's interesting. I wouldn't have guessed she was in Cosmopolitan. Uh, she utilized her platform to campaign for greater public acceptance of aviation, with a specific focus on encouraging women to enter into the field. In 1929, Amelia, appointed by the Transcontinental Air Transport to promote air travel, and she invested time and money establishing the Ludington Airline, the first Regional shuttle service between New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, Ludington Airline. I had never heard of that. That's interesting. I'm going to have to look into that a little bit. Uh, Ludington is the name of the town I was born in. Not that I was by D.C. This nasally accent that you're listening to doesn't come from the East Coast. It comes from the Midwest. But uh, Ludington, nonetheless, I've never heard that name used in anything else besides my hometown. So interesting there. <laughs> um, additionally, Amelia became an official of the National Aeronautic Association in 1930, advocating for separate women's records and contributing in international standards. In 1931, she set the world altitude record of 18,415 feet flying a Picarin PCA-2 auto gyro borrowed from Beech Nut Chewing Gum. No offense, but Beech Nut Chewing Gum just doesn't have a good ring to it. <laughs> um, I can't imagine why that's not around anymore, but hey, you know what? I would try it. I would, be, but I'm weird, so I would assume most people wouldn't. I probably know of one other person that would try Beech Nut Chewing Gum, um, and they do listen to the podcast, so maybe we'll have to go get a pack of it. <laughs> Amidst her achievements, Amelia maintained a commitment to advancing the cause of women aviation. She became involved in the 99s, an organization of female pilots that she co-founded, serving as its first president in 1930. I myself have been to the 99s conferences. Um, great. Great to see everybody involved. Uh, they do a lot of good stuff. We have actually donated money to that cause. Uh, so it's great to see more people getting involved in aviation and that it's still around surviving and going strong. So as we talked about Amelia's first flight across the Atlantic, now it was time for her to grab the yoke and just take off herself. Or shall I say in this case, the stick. On May 20th, 1932, at the age of 34, Amelia embarked on a historic journey from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, fueled by the ambition to replicate Charles Lindbergh's solo flight to Paris five years earlier. Equipped with a single-engine Lockheed Vega 5B and armed with a copy of the Telegraph Journal given to her by journalist Strut Sturman, Erdenhardt aimed to etch her name in aviation history. Bernd Bachlin, a renowned Norwegian-American aviator, served as Amelia's technical advisor for the flight. Bernd 
not only assisted in preparing the aircraft, but also acted as a decoy for the press. Oh, sensibly, Redding Earnhardt's Vega for her own Arctic flight. After a challenging 14-hour and 56-minute flight battling strong northerly winds, icy conditions, and mechanical issues, Amelia successfully landed in a pasture at Colmer, North Derry, Northern Ireland. The historic moment was witnessed by Cecil King and T. Sawyer. When asked by a curious farmhand if she had flown far, Earnhardt's assistant reply was, From America. As the first woman to fly nonstop across the Atlantic, Amelia earned accolades from recognitions. She was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross from Congress, the Cross of Knight, and the Legion of Honor from the French government, a gold medal of National Geographic Society from President Herbert Hoover. With her fame soaring, Amelia forged connections with influential figures, most notably First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. The two women bonded by shared interest and passion for women's causes. They developed a lasting friendship. Although Roosevelt obtained a student permit to fly after experience of flight with Amelia, she did not pursue further aviation endeavors. The friendship between Amelia and Roosevelt remained strong, with frequent communication through their lives. In the midst of Amelia's growing acclaim, another notable figure entered her life, Jacqueline Cochran. Initially considered a rival, but ultimately became a confidant during the period of Amelia's career. Amelia was also able to accomplish many other solo endeavors as leading up to her circumnavigating of the globe. But we're going to skip ahead of those uh, to really so I don't get to the point where nobody wants to listen to this because it's so, so long. Uh, but there's some really good information out there if you want to look at some of the other uh, solo flights that Amelia did. Uh, but we're going to go skip ahead to 1937 and the world flight. Um, now that's when the flight took place, but planning in 1935, Amelia took a role as a visiting faculty member of Purdue University, counseling women on careers and serving as a technical advisor to the Department of Aeronautics. This marked the beginning of Amelia's plan to circumnavigate the globe, a feat that would cover 29,000 miles and make her journey the longest in aviation, uh, roughly of the equator route. Purdue has a really good aviation program. Unlike other schools, they're willing to branch out and open up satellite locations at different airports. So they're taking a different knack than, say, like an Embry-Riddle or something where Embry-Riddle is very um, controlling of their uh, their brand and who has access to it. Uh, Purdue's more open and willing to let people fly their aircraft through different institutions, which, quite honestly, I, I do like that because it allows more people to get the opportunity to fly. But I can also understand Embry Riddle's wanting to hold it close to the chest and not necessarily uh, allow any operator to use their brand. But uh, regardless, Purdue has a really good aviation program. Uh, we actually see a lot of interns come in from Purdue University and they're just getting commercial service. They're naming their new terminal after Amelia Earhart and they are uh, attempting to get, well, actually, I believe they made an announcement. They were able to get commercial service back into the airport. So uh, good for them. Good school. Put it on your list. Um, so uh, with funding from Purdue, uh, Amelia's vision took shape in the form of a Lockheed Electra 10E. The aircraft underwent extensive modifications, including additional fuel tanks and the fuel silage, earning the moniker the Flying Laboratory. Captain Harry Manning, with experience as both a navigator and a pilot, was initially chosen to accompany Amelia in this ambitious journey. However, after concerns arose about Manning's navigational skills, Fred Noonan, an experienced navigator with a background in marine and flight navigation, joined the team. The original plan was for Noonan to navigate from Hawaii to Howland Island, with Manning continuing the journey to Australia and Amelia flying solar for the remaining of the project. The first attempt took off from Oakland, California, March 17, 1937, heading to Honolulu, Hawaii. Unfortunately, due to mechanical issues with the aircraft, the journey was halted and the Electra was shipped for repairs. Now, Oakland is a interesting uh, airport. I've uh, flown out of there many times when I lived in California. Uh, I like the airport. I have many friends that work there. Um, some people like working for there. A lot of other people don't like working for there. <laughs> um, Oakland's an interesting place. Uh, I don't know. I used to go over to the A's game. You could get a cheap seat, a hot dog, and a beer for $10 at the Coliseum. Or you could go over to downtown uh, uh, San Francisco and go to the Giants for 50 bucks and have cheap seats. But uh, to each their choice. But now they have no teams left in Oakland anyway. So uh, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, back to our story. 
Undeterred, Amelia and her husband, George Putnam, secured additional funds for an accept- second attempt, this time flying from west to east. Uh, Amelia and Noonan set off from Oakland to Miami, Florida on June 1, 1937. After stops in South America, Africa, and the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia, they arrived in La New Guinea on June 29th with about 22,000 miles completed. On July 2nd, 1937, Amelia and Newton departed La Field and Howard Island with their intended destination. The flight plan involved covering about 7,000 miles over the Pacific Ocean. As Amelia prepared for the journey to Howard Island, the U.S. Coast Guard sent Cutter Itastic to provide communication and navigation support. The Cutter's capabilities included radio communication, transmission of a homing signal, and radio direct refining, and creating a visual signal using smoke. However, these methods ultimately failed to guide Amelia to Howard Island. The Lockheed Electra 10E, the aircraft chosen for the world flight, was equipped with radio equipment for communications and navigation. The details of this equipment are not entirely clear, but it included a modified Western Electric Model 13C transmitter, a modified Western Electric Model 20B receiver, a transmitter, and a 50-watt crystal-controlled device could transmit three fixed frequencies, 500 kHz, 3105 kHz, and 6210 kHz. The receiver covered four frequency bands with modifications to enable the reception of 500 kHz signals. It had two antenna inputs and could select between low-frequency and high-frequency antennas. However, it's unclear whether it had a beat-frequency oscillator for detecting continuous wave transmissions. A separate automatic radio direction finder received a prototype Hooven radio compass had been installed but was later removed to save weight. Instead, a Bendix coupling unit was added to attach a conventional loop antenna to existing receiver, or possibly a Bendix RA1 auxiliary receiver with directional finding capabilities. Issues with the RDF equipment arose during the flight. It failed during a transatlantic leg and the journey and experienced problems at other points, including a leg from Honolulu to Holland. The RDFE equipment's limitations, frequency ranges, and proper use were sources of difficulty. As the Electra approached Howard Island, the United States Coast Guard's Itastica was stationed there to support the flight. However, misunderstandings and errors in communication schedules, time systems, and frequency capabilities complicated the final approach. The RDF equipment on the Electra failed. The attempts to establish two-way radio communication with the Itasca were unsuccessful. During the last known transmissions, Amelia reported running out of fuel and being unable to hear the Itasca. The Itasca received voice transmissions from Amelia, but couldn't transmit voice signals on the frequency she requested. Smoke signals generated by the Itasca and radio signals from Amelia's plane failed to establish the necessary connection for navigation. The final transmission from Amelia at 8.43 a.m. on July 2nd, 1937, indicated they were on line of position, believing they were near Holland Island. Unfortunately, this was incorrect by about five nautical miles. The subsequent search efforts involving the Itasca, the U.S. Navy, and later private searches proved unsuccessful in locating Amelia, Noonan, and the Lockheed Electric 10E. Unfortunately, this is where the mystery deepens. The Electra disappeared without a trace. The last known position was near Nukaman Islands, approximately 800 miles into the flight. So as with any great mystery in aviation, there are many, many great conspiracy theories. And we've covered a lot of that in these podcasts, not necessarily on Amelia, but right UFO sightings, aircraft disappearing. Uh, it even has a lot of that flair in our standard uh, uh wallpaper that we use for this podcast where we have a little alien ship up in the corner because it's a mystery podcast right and we're filled with mysteries like scooby and the gang we're going to split up and look for clues so let's talk a little bit about uh some of these hypotheses if you will so our first here is not necessarily outside the realm of what we would consider probably what actually happened here i, I would think um this is the crash and sink theory uh this theory suggests that Amelia and Newton ran out of fuel while searching for Holland Island, ditched at sea, and died. It is based on radio transmissions and signal strength analysis. Uh, The U.S. Coast Guard concluded that she ran out of fuel close and to the north of Holland Island based on her last confirmed messages. Uh, This seems the most logical, obviously, never finding the crash site lends to this being, well, is that what actually happened? Um, If they were able to find something, some piece of wreckage or something, they probably would have 
garnered less of this other stuff. I mean, let's be honest. Anything could have, you could have a story dead to rights and there still would be conspiracy theories. So, but in this case, the fact that there's a lack of evidence leads to other stuff. So now we have the Gardner Island hypothesis. Uh, some proposed that Amelia and Newton were unable to find Howard Island, turned to the south to look for other islands, possibly flying over Gardner Island. Uh, the International Group of Historic Aircraft Recovery has conducted expeditions to the Gardner Island, or it's referred also to, and I'm going to say this, probably butcher it, Nikimaroro, Nick, 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 Nikimaroro. Well, yeah, that sounds right. Nikki Mororo. I'm sure that's what uh, people <laughs> would say it's called. Uh, they found artifacts suggesting the possibility of Amelia landed there and ultimately perished. Um, Japanese capture theory. The theory suggests that Amelia and Noonan were captured by Japanese forces, uh, potentially in the Marshall Islands or Saipan. Uh, some claim to have witnessed Amelia's execution, but there has been little independent confirmation of these accounts. The 2017 History Channel uh, documentary, Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence, was discredited and critics argued that the Japanese capture hypothesis is not supported by geography and navigation rules. Uh, So there's some myth, legends, and claims. Uh, Various unsupported theories and claims had surfaced over the years. There were rumors about Amelia being a spy for FDR or serving as a Tokyo Rose but investigations found no credible evidence. The possibility that Amelia turning back mid-flight to reach Rabel, New Britain, has been suggested but lacks any substantial evidence. Uh, The theory that uh, Amelia survived and has a new identity as Irene uh, Bolum and lived in New Jersey, and this is presented in the book Amelia Earhart Lives, uh, was discredited. Uh, forensic analysis cited measurable facial differences between uh, Amelia and Irene. So you really run the gamut of uh, conspiracy theories uh, and <laughs> what's going on. Now, the reason why I wanted to do this podcast, one, there's someone I very much admire who's a kick-ass woman, <laughs> uh, breaking ceilings and moving across uh, all spectrums of industries and kind of reminds me of Amelia Earhart. And then secondly, we have a news article that's out uh, about this disappearance and potentially that someone spotted something. So let's talk a little bit about that article. So I'm going to say this is a significant amount of money up front. Uh, a former U.S. Air Force officer spent $11 million searching for Amelia Earhart's long lost plane and reports as of a few weeks ago say he may have found it. Now, I was actually in Aruba when the story was first breaking out and coming. And I thought to myself, I was like, oh, that would be a great podcast. I know everybody's heard the story, but uh, to just get into a little bit of detail of who Amelia was and then where we are and where this story currently lies. So Tony Romo, a former U.S. Air Force officer, embarked on a high-tech expedition using a $9 million unmanned submersible drone called Hugen to search for the long-lost Lockheed 10E Electra plane. After a 100-day voyage covering 5,200 square miles of the ocean floor, Romeo captured a sonar image that he believes to show the wreckage of Amelia's plane. The sonar image was taken about 100 miles from the Holland Island, near the reported location where Amelia's plane is believed to have gone down. The finding has generated interest from experts, with some expressing cautious optimism, however. Others emphasize the need for clearer views and additional details, such as the plane's serial number, for conclusive identification. Romeo plans to return to the area to further investigate using autonomous or robotic submersibles, equipments, cameras, and sonars to capture better images. If the discovery is confirmed, there will likely be a collaboration with various entities, including the Smithsonian Institution, to study potential salvages of the plane. The expedition was guided in part by a dateline theory suggesting that Earnhardt's navigation system became inaccurate after crossing the international dateline during her flight, potentially leading to her tragic disappearance. This development adds a new chapter in the decades-long mystery surrounding Amelia Earnhardt's disappearance, and the confirmation finding could close one of the great mysteries of the 20th century. So... I'm sure that this uh, individual, Mr. Romo, is trying to garner more money for his expedition. But the fact that we now have new technology and submersibles where you could literally send it out and scan 5,200 miles of ocean floor versus having an expedition try to do that allows maybe for potentially this to happen. Um, I know with every great mystery, there's always some part of it where you want the mystery to continue on. But, you know, for closure, it would be interesting to see 
And this actually turns out to be the aircraft in question, and we finally know of Amelia's final resting place. Uh, you know, like I said, you see a lot happening right now. There's respurred interest. Being a pilot right now is fantastic. So getting these articles out there, getting people hyped up, interested in aviation, um, you know, and I learned a lot going through this. I learned about some great chewing gum that I'm going to get for somebody in my life. <laughs> I'm looking online right now, and you can actually get the Beech Nut brand chewing gum on eBay from back in the 1930s for $600. And shucks, Valentine's Day was just over. <laughs> oh, there's always next year. <laughs> Well, we're pushing the 40-minute mark here, my friends, so I probably will sail off here. I apologize for being a little bit tardy on getting this out. I will get back into a routine here. If you like hearing my nasally accent, please feel free to always drop me in line at dapodcast85 at gmail.com. Stickers are on the website. Uh, yeah, other than that, my friends, I will see you down the runway. <laughs>